Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We'll be discussing overcoming challenges of CNV and sequence variant interpretation in the clinical lab. My name is Gary Sheets, and I'll be your host. Let's get started. The Mastermind Genomic Search Engine is the most comprehensive source of genomic evidence and can be used to quickly identify papers for patient diagnosis and treatment decisions. In today's webinar, we'll explore a major clinical laboratory's approach for interpreting C and V and sequence variants and discuss a variety of clinical cases that illustrate how Mastermind reduces the likelihood of VUS classification and creates more positive molecular diagnoses. So really exciting conversation planned today. Um, note today's presentation will include professional edition features of Mastermind. If you don't already have a Mastermind account, you can create one easily today with the bit.ly link that you see on your screen um, and start with a free trial of Mastermind Pro. So do take advantage of that. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of great information to share. Um, so I'll mention a housekeeping item and then I'll introduce our speakers. If you're joining us live, feel free to drop your questions down into the Q&A. Um, and if we have time, we'll get to those at the end. Uh, also, this webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you once we've wrapped up. Now, we'll introduce our speakers. We're joined today by Kylie Yap, the Director of Molecular Diagnostics at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Her clinical expertise lies in the genetic diagnosis of pediatric constitutional disorders and childhood malignancies. Hi, Kylie. Hi, Garrett. Uh, we also have Brittany Jones, Genomenon's Director of Customer Success, who has extensive experience um, in clinical NGS applications from assay development all the way to enterprise software implementation. Hi, Brittany. Hi, Garrett. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you both for being here and sharing your expertise. Um, Brittany's going to get us started with an overview of how Mastermind can be used to search CNVs. Um, and then Kylie will greatly expand on the conversation in the context of Lurie and their work in this space. So Britt, take it away. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna go through a very quick introduction. I just wanted to ensure that when Kylie starts speaking, everyone's able to kind of follow the slides and understand what those the screenshots look like for CNV analysis and searching within Mastermind. Um, so one of the big concepts here is that Mastermind is an associations engine. So you can search by many different uh, types of information. Not only do we accept, say, variants uh, like uh, SNVs, NDELs, we also accept uh, copy number variant nomenclature and we'll search those in our system. We can then link those across to different diseases, phenotypes, and other types of information, like is this a functional study that the author is describing? Um, so that's the kind of different information that we link together in our system. For CNV searching specifically, we accept many different types of nomenclature. Um, Kylie will actually reference in her slides that you know, she had a deletion in a specific gene. Um, so we can take that type of nomenclature kind of as you talk, like I have a deletion in EGFR exon 19 as I've typed here. What the system then does is converts that to coordinates and does what I like to describe as a fuzzy search. Um, so not only do we search the exact, you know, exon 19 start to end, but then we'll give you every copy number variant that's been published um, in over eight and a half million articles, which is what our database has. We'll give you every one of those CNVs and then the amount of overlap with the copy number variant you've searched. So this accounts for the different types of assays that are used, the different calling pipelines that are used in order to um, call and annotate CNVs, right? It really is a comprehensive sensitive search. By default, when you see coordinates in our system, those are for build 38. However, in the system, you can actually search by uh, coordinates from HG19 and just tell us that by typing HG19 in the search bar. Um, so I just kind of wanted to bring that to everyone's attention in case you do end up, uh, if you are able to try these features. Once you launch that search, what you see is, is several panes in the window that is returned. So I'm kind of highlighting here in the top left, what you'll see is a track-based system. So as I already uh, mentioned, we're not just launching the search for the singular, let's say in this case, exon 19, right, deletion that I searched. We're also showing every copy number variant nearby and the space that it's occupying, as well as the amount of overlap, 
right? So if there's a search, you can see a couple down in this table here on the, the left. There's another one that's for Exxon 18 to 21, right? And so we'll give those and then give the amount of overlap for that C and B. Once you do go over to the articles, which is on the right side here, what you'll notice is by clicking on a singular article, that's that light blue bar that you see, you get the sentence fragments for that. So these are actually sentences from the article that we're displaying that contain the matches for the terms that you've searched. So in this case, again, it's EGFR Exxon 19. And you can really see the power of the genomics language processing engine here in the bottom right, because you can see that we're highlighting, you can see the sentence as it's piecing together this Exxon 19 deletion and EGFR. Right, so you can see the variability of how authors describe and, and, and talk about these things, and that we have to match all of that. So that's really the power in the, the genomics language processing engine. We don't just match the exact coordinates for the search, we match how they talk about these types of things in articles. One thing I wanna highlight here is there's a little um, target next to the article title right here in the, in the, in the middle right pane. Um, that denotes that this is an exact match for what you've searched. Because again, we're doing that sort of what I like to call fuzzy matching, right? Where we're at, where we're allowing for copy number variants to be searched that aren't exactly what you searched for. Um, we denote the ones that are an exact match with this, this target. This will be important because Kylie has some, uh, some exact matches in, in some of her slides later. We do the exact same thing. Um, so the target denotes the same thing on the uh, SNV and Indel side with things like intronic variants, right? So here some, we searched uh, a change and gave it a cDNA nomenclature at the negative two position, right? A to C change there in the search bar. You'll see the target here on the, on the right. And then in the sentence fragments, again, you can see that exact match, right? So the negative two A to C. But we also additionally match and I've highlighted this here with the lack of target. <laughs> um, we also match things that are at the same in the same splice acceptor, but that aren't the exact same change. And this can actually help, this can aid in determining the pathogenicity of a singular variant, because you may need to see this other change, right? The negative two C to T, there may be more evidence that also is a potentially, that also is potentially disrupting the same splice site. Um, finally, the last thing I just wanted to, to talk about is we actually do have the ability to annotate files. So if, you, if um, your lab has a workflow whereby you annotate, you have a pipeline that you've designed to annotate uh, this type of information, we can actually take in those files. So in this case, I'm showing DCF format, although we have some other options too. Um, we can take that file and look, go, um, search every single variant within the entire file in Mastermind give you the number, that's what I've highlighted down here, the number of articles that match that variant, as well as a link to those articles within our system, and then provide that file back as the return. Um, so this is a way in which you can build it into pipelines, because Kylie is going to describe the LORI pipeline that they've worked on. Um, with that, I think I will leave it to Kylie. I think that gives you a little bit of an overview of what you're going to be seeing in some of her slides, and then I'll let her get, get us to the science. Hey, Brittany, thank you so much for, you know, talking about how, you know, kind of a refresher for me as well as to how we really could make use a mastermind for some of these processes and searches and all that. Um, I'm going to start sharing my slides. Let's make sure that it is the right screen. Okay. So I'm going to get started today um, kind of sharing about the our process for overcoming challenges of C and V in sequence interpretation um, in our lab. So I'm from the Louis Children's Hospital Molecular Diagnostics Lab. I'm the director. So today, kind of going through a couple of things that um, you know we have encountered in the lab and how have we have essentially tried to overcome them with certain processes that we have um, adopted. So kind of a short introduction of um, who we are. So as part of the Louis Molecular Diagnostics Lab, we specialize in genetic testing for pediatric germline disorders and somatic malignancies. There are a few different diagnostic methodologies that we use in the lab. One of the, our largest volume tests is the whole, whole genome chromosome microarray, and that we accomplish by doing an array CGH. 
Um, we have sequence and deletion duplication analysis of gene panels, and that we do with um, NGS. We have targeted CNV analysis that we, we do by MLPA, and also smaller specific targeted variant analysis or single gene analysis that we would do by Sanger sequencing. So here are the kind of the um, topics that I'll be kind of going through today. So I'll be describing what we do here at Louis, kind of our established framework for the interpretation and classification of CNV and sequence variants at our lab. I'm going to elaborate on some of the challenges and pitfalls that could be encountered, especially during the process of the search and evaluation of published literature, and kind of end off with some illustration of our processes by a couple of clinical case examples. And, and it's kind of a disclosure is that I'm referencing a number of different um, commercial and academic software and tools. And this just has been incorporated into our interpretation workflows we have established in our lab. So I think we're all familiar with you know, how NGS data and array CGH or microarray, whole genome chromosome microarray gives us a huge amount of data. Um, we have the sequence variants, we have the CNVs that needs to be processed and analyzed. So what we have adopted in our laboratory is to have our NGS sequence variants pass through to Fabric Genomics. Um, this is our tertiary analysis software for variant classification and interpretation. For our CNVs that are both from our NGS data set and the array CGH, we pass them through Nexus Clinical and this is the software that we use for our tertiary analysis of our, uh, of our copy number variants. So essentially, this two system, it all kind of lies in a very similar decision framework. Of course, there are some specific nuances that are different between the interpretation of sequence variants and copy number variants. But the, the large framework is pretty consistent. There are a couple of you know, big bucket items that we would assess for every variant that passes through the lab for interpretation. Um, and of course, we, you know, we follow very much the guidelines that's put up by ACNG and AMP um, regarding the interpretation of sequence variants and CNVs. But I guess, you know, we could kind of break it up into five buckets um, that, you know, that these are the things that we look at in a, in a clinical setting. The very first one is almost always population frequency. How frequent is that variant? in the general population. I'm talking about exec and nomad for the sequence variants, and a DGV or nomad SVs for the CNV, CNVs that we see, because that can essentially inform us of whether that variant is concerning. If they are common, you know, we rule them out as you know, population polymorphisms. Predicted effect of variants, um, that is something that we have to examine. You know, are those variants, um, deletion variants, loss of function, um, because those would Similarly, impact, you know, are we looking at the mutation spectrum of the disease? Does that variant that we find match what has been known to be disease causing? We would also examine classifications given by other labs and that are entered into ClinVar or the curation that's rendered by ClinGen. We will look at potential inheritance of those variants um, within the family. So those are usually accomplished by additional testing, um, either, either through the parents or other potentially affected family members. Um, but one key information that we have to rely on is in the reviewing the literature, um, how much literature support is there for supporting that this variant or gene has an association with human disease. So this whole process of you know, literature support for looking at pediatric germline disorders, I would say that for rare genetic conditions, the discovery of you know, one singular publication can, can really impact the classification of a variant. Um, potentially, you know, we would, we would, without, without a viable publication, we may be classifying a variant as a variant of unknown significance, but with a very strong publication that indicates a clear association of the variant with disease that could sometimes allow us to move the public, um, the classification from a VWS to lightly pathogenic or, or pathogenic. So these are essentially uh, what we consider as rendering a molecular diagnosis for the patient. Um, if we think that 
the variant is disease causing and is explanatory for the patient's phenotype, that's when we achieve a molecular diagnosis for the patients. So as you can imagine, if you fail to detect relevant publications during the variant interpretation process, that is usually one of the biggest causes of missing a molecular diagnosis during genetic testing. So examining, you know, what are the potential fail points of how we can do better to make sure that we don't miss publications, you know, how do we kind of look at what are, what are possible reasons why those relevant publications actually get missed in the first place, right? I think it ties into also reviewing some of the bioinformatic processes that we have in the lab during clinical interpretation. A couple of things that I'm going to bring up is, you know, really looking at our pipeline when we examine the literature that goes in, that is that might be associated with the variants that we are seeing in a specific case. A lot of labs will be using curated literature database. Um, and because it is a clinical pipeline, we validate, we lock them down once they're validated. Those, pi those, those pipelines and databases are not always like real time um, updated because this is not, not possible to do. Um, so the databases that are used, used could be validated you know, from a few months back, although most labs have a schedule of updating their internal databases to make sure that it's up to date, but it's never going to be up to date at current status, right? You're still going to have a few um, months or weeks of lag, depending on how frequent the update process is for the internal databases. And sometimes it's just that you've done your job, you've updated your databases, but then the publication just is missing from the curated database, just didn't, didn't make it to the curation. Um, so there's nothing you can do in your pipeline that will remedy that. And occasionally, you know, when we search for variants, um, when we're looking for relevant publications for the variants, it's just really hard to make sure that we don't miss a variant because of an error in entering the nomenclature during search, um, or maybe because some publications have named the genes a slightly different way, named the variants a slightly different way. Um, and that is, I think, especially pertinent for variants like copy number, um, variants because for those variants, you know, the breakpoints tend to be a lot more variable in terms of softwares, and we don't have such a good way of ensuring that we have the right nomenclature, uh, unlike the sequence variants that you know most labs will follow his GBS. So these are the methods that you know we think that we could use for assessing gene variant literature for our clinical interpretation. So this is definitely something that the clinical lab a lot of labs have kind of, you know, kind of put together a framework. This is what we have kind of assessed. Um, so talking about, you know, curated literature database um, that describes gene variants and disease association, a lot of clinical labs, you know, would refer to HGMD. And this is also what internally we have done. We have annotations brought in for every single variant that we see during the bioinformatics pipeline to, to cross-check to make sure that are there any HGMD annotations on that specific variant. So that's done for every single variant. Um, but this is not done for our copy number analysis because it's just hard to match CNV breakpoints with a curated database like HGMD. So this is not done for our CNV interpretation. The next thing we do is to rely on search engines. You know, if the curated databases don't pull a relevant annotation, we reflect to a search engine, and that you know really could be a pretty big variety. You know, you could PubMed, you could Google, um, and what we have kind of landed on in our lab is to use a Mastermind to kind of aid in this comprehensive search for genetic variants and its association with human disease. And the last thing that you know really, if you don't find anything, you try to gather unpublished data, and you could either do that through private correspondence, if you have relationship with a researcher that is known to be an expert in a certain disease, it may have a knowledge of a specific variant, um, you could gather information from that. Uh, on a larger perspective, kind of a crowdsourcing way is, you know, there's a NCBI supported website, Gene Matcher, where you could then input that information in there to see if there are any hits that other labs have sub submitted with a similar variant that will be relevant to your interpretation of the of the case. So what we have done in, in a Lurie Molecular Diagnostics Lab is our lit search, lit search process 
obviously, like we acknowledge, is a is a very important process in clinical interpretation and variant classification. So we've kind of reviewed our process to see, you know, how we can do better because obviously we know that literature missing literature review is really a key key source of missing diagnosis for um or making making significant classifications for the clinical variants that we see in the lab every day. So our goal was to establish an efficient process for clinical testing um, with a high yield for the review process such that you know it's efficient, but yet we would get to the point of looking at relevant publications in a very short amount of time. So like I mentioned, we have our pipeline variant annotations with our bioinformatics processes to really pull in the information from a curated database like HGMD. But like I mentioned, it's a static database. So we pull that from HGMD and we validate that. And so on a daily basis, every single variant has a cross check on does that variant have an annotation in HGMD. And we look at that with um, for our sequence variants with the knowledge that you know this information could be outdated. Um, we have a variant review process that is a live search on HGMD professional. Um, just because we know that you know whatever was annotated could be outdated by the time it gets to a review process. So this live live search process, you know, we look at it from for both the sequence variants and the CNVs, but this is reliant on the curated database being updated at the point of search. Um, one new thing that we started doing when, when we um, onboarded the usage of Fabric and Mastermind was that in the Fabric Genomics, there is a Mastermind button in the Fabric for every single variant that we see to indicate and alert us that it's the availability of a Mastermind information in the database. Um, so we are able to see that. And so that's another kind of um, area that we would cross check to make sure that we're not missing any potential publications that are out there for this variance. And then in the absence of failure of any, everything else above to capture any publications, and if we are really suspicious of any specific variance, or in our CNB interpretation workflow where all this in pipeline annotations are not possible, we would do a search on the Mastermind Professional um, website because that is the live search so that we know that you know, our interpretations, we're not missing any publications that have just been out the last week, for example. And then at the end of the day, if still nothing comes up and you're still very suspicious, you know, we, we consider turning to Gene Matcher to submit those variants for um, matching, but that is, you know, our bar for doing that is pretty high. It has to be a really suspicious variant that, you know, you know warrants the additional investigation and time for that submission to happen. So I have a couple of clinical cases that I'll be kind of going through to illustrate how we review our literature and how some of these um, search tools that I've mentioned have benefited us in our clinical interpretation for this variant. And I have you know, three cases to, to kind of go through. So case number one, you know, kind of to illustrate you know, the challenges of matching up literature support for copy number variants. So like I mentioned, we do um, systematically a pretty large number of whole chromosome, whole genome chromosome microarrays in the laboratory. So we encounter a lot of instances where, you know, we have to be able to decipher is there a relevant publication for a specific copy number variant that we see within a pretty short amount of time. So in this case over here, um, we have a four-year male with global developmental delay and breath hold holding episodes. So, you know, not exactly very specific phenotypes, but um, we did detect a three megabase loss at 18Q12, Q1, um, Q12. And so this deletion, um, the first thing we do, and this is this is a view from our Nexus clinical um, workflow and our interpretation uh, workflow, we have this view where we are able to review the genes that are in the region, the DGV tracks. So DGV is a database of normal. So do we see any, you know, large number of population 
who have the same CNV? And the answer is is no. Um, you know, there's uh, way smaller ones that are have been seen, but nothing that has been this big. So there's definitely we can conclude there's the absence of a similar CNV of the of particular size in DGV. Um, and that's really one database that we use that is very graphical in our interpretation of CNVs that we can rely on. Of course, we have the ClinGen postnatal tracks that we would reference, cross-reference. The next thing we do is to really look at literature support for the deletion, right? So um, this was a, a case where, you know, we were still investigating the use of a mastermind. And so our initial protocol was always to go to HGMD and we exa examine the spectrum of, you know, disease causing variants for the genes that are in the region. So in this particular region, there is a gene called CELF4 that is deleted. It is a full gene deletion. So seeing that deletion in that three megabase um, deletion is one of the genes that is associated with a potentially autosomal dominant condition. So we you know, we decided to kind of dig further. Are there any literature that support that deletion of this gene could be disease causing and associated with a phenotype? So our first step was to go to HGMD and we input CLF4 in HGMD to see what are the different types of variants that have been reported as disease causing. And being presented with this view, um, I would say that, you know, this is what we would assess as something that is questionable because we don't have a disease causing designation for like say a clear gross deletion of the gene um, there is one entry but you know it's dm question mark which we know sometimes turns out to be a publication that is not exactly curated to be really supportive of a disease association um, there's been some sequence variants so the the lack of literature just makes us you know suspicious that is this is this really disease causing and i would say looking at this data from what we are presented from HGMD, our initial initial impression was like, well, this you know is probably a VUS or might even be largely benign because the association just is is not clear. So this is how we would fall when we look at something like these um, based on the mutation spectrum that we are able to review on HGMD. So because we have um, we have the privilege of using Mastermind. Um, we decided to put this information into Mastermind. So like what Brittany have described, we in, we input a deletion of CLF4 um, without the breakpoints, just by entering the gene name. Then Mastermind would match with a breakpoints and potentially show us what are the different um, papers that have actually mentioned this association. And so one of these um, things that came up was um, looking at exact matches, right? So we want something that not just surrounds a deletion that surrounds CLF4, we want, we want a deletion that actually contains the whole gene. So that's what we look out for. And in our literature that gets pulled, there's one paper that seems to be um, indicated that there is a deletion or what is what they call a haploinsufficiency of CLF4 that is associated with, you know, the different um, non-developmental disorders, right? So something that, you know, we could, you know, really go deep, deeper into it and see um, is this a relevant literature for us. Um, and then kind of, you know, kind of trying to match up what we see in HGMD and Mastermind. So this paper that, you know, from Mastermind that we thought was relevant that actually showed a truncation of this gene at 18Q12.2, that is correctly annotated as a de deletion of CLF4 in Mastermind. Um, we realized then later in HGMD that it is in HGMD, but because it's a 2012 paper, right? So we would think, you know, it should be in HGMD. So it is in HGMD, but it was annotated as a translocation, but just not a deletion. So essentially, you know, by kind of a quick look at HGMD, we didn't even appreciate that that was a deletion because um, HGMD didn't annotate that as, as such. So that was one thing that we thought was interesting is that, you know, in terms of pulling out variants accurately as what was described in the paper, we do appreciate that Mastermind does perform that, at least for this case, seems to be performing pretty well. And then kind of going deeper into what else is there, you know, looking more broadly, because at that point, the only publication HGMD that seems to indicate there is an association is this um, that bet we can find in Mastermind. Are there any other papers out there that will bolster our um, 
kind of concerned about this gene. And so we found additional papers that um, provided support that CLF4 deletions are concerning. And that, you know, there's been a number of papers that have talked about how deletions in 18Q12 that encompass CLF4 as a candidate gene is could be disease causing that is associated with a developmental disorder. So that you know brings us additional paper. This paper was published in 2017. Um, so interestingly, this paper was not in HCMD, which you know just just didn't let us uh, review that. So so it was great that you know we were able to isolate additional papers with the use of mastermind to support that you know this gene could be really truly associated with disease. So kind of you know I think it kind of recalibrated about what we what we think is what we should be reporting for the CNV. So initially when we first started, you know, we were in the, between a VUS, solid benign interpretation, maybe a VUS, but based on the literature support that we have, you now we still decided to be relatively conservative that, you know, I, I th we think that this is, this, is, this is a pretty strong association based on the additional papers that we can pull. There's a reasonable suspicion. Um, so we recommended that Parental testing is strongly considered. We don't always do that for CNVs, like VUS CNVs, because a lot of times we assume that they would be inherited and not disease causing. But for this case, we had a reasonable suspicion to think that this is you know, going to turn out to be disease causing. And we rec strongly recommend that parental testing is done because this gene is associated with the autosomal dominant condition. So the report went out as a VUS and with a strong recommendation for parental testing. And ultimately, when we have the parents come back in for testing for this specific variant, the deletion was found to be de novo. So essentially kind of cementing the idea that this CNV is the most likely cause of the patient's phenotype. So then we recalibrate our interpretation of this variant that this is, you know, this is disease causing because of the literature support that it is, plus the fact that it is, it is de novo. So that's my first case. And then the second case kind of um, you know, touches on kind of a slightly different challenge that we have, like, you know, how do we catch new publications in a timely fashion? Um, and sometimes you just find that things just collide in such a way that the timing, <laughs> a difference of weeks and, and, you know, in the lab can really make a difference as to, you know, whether you are able to adequately call variants the way that they, you know, accurately according to the literature support. So in this case, we have a, a two-year-old female with Evans syndrome, anemia, thermocytopenia, Kawasaki disease. So this is one of the one of the patients that typically may receive um, a primary immunodeficiency NGS panel in our lab. So in this panel that we we perform, we have um, 328 genes. There were 19 variants that were isolated for additional analyses that were at least a VUS classification that is additional review. So that's a you know, pretty large number of variants because of the size of the gene panel. Um, and one of the genes that kind of, you know, we were reviewing and the, the point I was trying to bring out about this variant um, is that during preliminary review, there was really a lack of literature support for this variant. Um, at that time, you know, we we looked at it, you know, we we knew that this is probably at least going to be a VUS in our regular pipeline for looking at HGMZ annotations. For this case, it did not pull any relevant publications. So this is this will be one of the cases where this is probably going to be be a VUS. We and we kind of move on from that. Um, except, you know, there was a splicing prediction that was relatively suspicious on the last it was a base change in the last base of the axon intron boundary that you know instantly you know makes this variant relatively suspicious um the you know because because of that we think that it, it disrupts the canonical splice site but to be able to then say that this could be disease causing we really need literature support that either says that this this variant has been reported as associated with disease or this, you know, essentially a similar variant of this nature, right, that causes a, a canonical splice change is going to be associated with disease. So we kind of, you know, went into 
looking because TCMD initially didn't have anything, um, we went into Mastermind to see what we can pull up. Um, and we did see a paper from 2019 that described how a CTLA-4 spice variant could be associated with a monogenic um, immunodeficiency disorder, which was kind of interesting. And then you know, what we kind of look back on, so essentially going back to our HCMD and to kind of really review because our whole process of very interpretation in the lab was to see, you know, when we catch something that could have been missed, like, like well, how, how can we do better to make sure that we don't miss this in the future? So really reviewing the HGMD entries that were that were about this variant. Um, so the interesting case is that it, you know, the timeline actually really matters for this case. So when this when this case came through in the lab, and which I'll present the timeline later on, um, the HGMD annotations that I referred to for the static database, this publication um, apparently had not made it into that version yet because our pipelines were annotating on annotating on this version of um, HGMD, which was the 2021 quarter three update, which is why when we go to the the um, live version, HGMD Professional, they present the 2021 quarter four updates, and that version does have the publication, but although a different publication that was previously presented by, by Mastermind. So that that version of HGMD does have the um, a relevant publication for this specific variant that we're looking at. But then it was still missing the previous paper that we had pulled out from 2019 from Mastermind. So kind of an illustration of what exactly I'm talking about, right? So we have this case that came into us for testing December of 2021. They arrived in the lab. We annotated, we processed the sample of bioinformatics pipeline, annotated on the HGMD version 2021 quarter three update. And then of course, at the point of review of the variant, because it was December, right? So in a matter of like, I think the previous week, HGMD 2021 quarter four update was released. So that was a paper that, you know, would have been released. We would have caught it in the in the manual review when we review those variants for those variants in the live pool of um, view in HGMD professional. And so we were still able to pull this paper. But however, you know, the, the previous paper from 2019 um, was still missing from HGMD. So overall, you know, looking at this this effect of you know assessing, you know, like you know, while we could have missed this variant if if not for the fact that you know we were of course alerted by Mastermind and then it get us to review what was in HGMD, and then really found like two papers that were defining that this particular variant is disease causing, and you know you may ask what is the what is the big deal of missing one paper, right? You have two, you missed one, shouldn't be a big problem. Um, except, you know, the missing paper from HCMD is a pretty high relevance for our patient because this paper actually described this particular variant with a functional effect with a more similar phenotype for our patient, like an immunodeficiency presentation. So, so this really kind of cemented our classification that, you know, this variant is pathogenic and then you can kind of see as to how we went from because of the lack of literature support for this variant in the initial stage of review due to the you know the timeline effect of not having that literature support really getting pulled in during the pipeline thinking that is the VUS but then ultimately being able to reclassify this as pathogenic because of the availability of pulling this relevant literature support to say that this this variant is actually disease causing for this patient. And it is because CTLA-4 is associated with an autosomal dominant condition um, that is related to, to um, autoimmune, autoimmunity and immunodeficiency, which is very relevant for this patient. So kind of in my, in my last um, case, just to quickly go through some of the um, processes that we, we do. And also what I've described is our CNV analysis and now from a microarray, we have the 
um, panel testing that we do. Um, the previous case was about panel testing. Um, we do review some exomes and genome data sets in our lab. And so we have a, and I think that really being able to pull literature support for this large scale genomic testing is, is even of a higher priority because of the huge number of variants that could be seen. So we have this case um, of a 13 year old male of Pakistani descent, and he has a very complex medical history, but overall it seems like he was dealing with a lot of you know, GI obstruction issues. Um, he had sort of a dysautonomia, some neurogenic bladder, orosetic hypotension. Um, he has a pretty strong family history of parental consanguinity. His parents and grandparents are first cousins. So that's, that does elevate the suspicion for a genetic condition. So the clinical genetics team had sent a whole exome to a reference lab that was reported as um, non-diagnostic and that was resulted in November of 2020. So as part of a research study that we, we had um, we had just opened up close to that point in time. I think that was in probably December of 2020 that we started the research study. This patient was enrolled due to their non-diagnostic genetic finding from exome sequencing. So we enrolled them in our genome study to get genome sequencing. But at the same time, they were to receive a exome reanalysis from us. And at that point, we did isolate this CHRNA3 two base pair homozygous loss of function variant in this gene um, that is pretty rare in NOMAD. There were no homozygous described in the database, not previously seen in ClinVar or HGMD. And, and to be honest, at that time, we were not quite using Mastermind yet in our, in our pipeline. This was one of the cases that kind of you know, supported us doing that, and I will kind of solely illustrate why. Um, so when we first started in you know, looking at this gene, and it's associated with human disease. Well, we go, like I said, we go to HGMD, we pull out the papers that we can find. There was a description of a splice variant, which is not exactly the same as what this patient has. Ours is a two base pair deletion. This is a splice variant description. Um, so not exactly the same variant, but kind of looking at the realm of, we are looking for loss of function variants. If this is if this qualifies as that, you know, we want to review and see what is the association of this gene with disease and in this paper it seems like you know five affected individuals from three unrelated families have urinary tract obstruction um, that is due they think to truncating variants in chrna3 All right so okay it's pretty interesting i don't know what do we do about this is there any relevance to what our patient have um so at that point in time, you know, we really didn't have a whole lot to go off with, with just that one paper. Um, and that was really before we systematically were able to use Mastermind. So at that time, we had submitted this variant to GeneMatcher, this variant, this particular variant with the gene to GeneMatcher. And one of the reasons to support us doing that was also there was a mouse knockout model that supports like there's a bladder phenotype with patients um, sorry, in mice with deletions in CHRNA3. So we thought it was maybe strong enough for us to go through this this um, process of doing um, gene matcher submission. And sort of illustrating this last point, right? You know, if you really have no literature support, um, you go to gene matcher, you submit it, and see what comes back. And the interesting about this case is almost immediately we got a contact from a different institution describing two individuals with the same exact variant. In fact, one of them, exactly the same variant and also in a homozygous state. And she was able to share with me that these are the patient's phenotype. The patient had, the baby's patients had autostatic hypotension, history of bowel obstruction, neurogenic bladder. And that was a pretty, pretty good match for our patient. <laughs> and at that point, you know, there was some suspicion that I'd be talking about the same patient because we had one patient who had the exactly same variant, homozygous, same two base deletion. But we verified that, you know, her patient was different from mine, but they have a pretty similar phenotype. And, you know, and like I said, in the realm of a rare pediatric disorder, if you have data like that, that almost very strongly supports that this is a disease causing variant for the patient because you know, the chance of, of um, two different patients having the same exact variant and showing the same phenotype 
it's just a very low likelihood unless that gene and variant is truly disease causing. Um, so, so at that point, you know, we were really suspicious of what this is. Then the paper was published in May of 2021. And at that point when we contacted them, it was it was March 2021. So this paper was really not published yet. So through this you know process of reanalysis, we were able to you know have the clinical team that we reanalyzed and you know isolated this variant that has emerging evidence to establish also function as a mechanism of disease for this gene, and that we think that this is disease causing for this patient, of course due to private correspondence with somebody else who had a patient with a similar phenotype and a similar variant, right? So, but the publications were not out yet. But this was, you know, what we were, you know, very comfortable with, you know, rendering this final classification, but really kind of, again, illustrating that data, either published literature data or unpublished is really key for the diagnosis of some of this um, rare pediatric disorders. Um, and then kind of going back to, you know, why, why sometimes variants just, you know, like it's not kind of like, you know, why was the exome completed in November 2020, not reporting this variant? Um, you would think that the 2019 paper published would have raised reasonable suspicion about the variant if it was seen. Um, but again, you know, we, we wouldn't know at that point in time, you know, what kind of databases the reference labs are using, what are the reasons why they, they would not review that publication. It's, it's hard to imagine and we have no way of knowing that process. But what we could do is, you know, kind of reviewing this to try to kind of as a test case, right? How, how can we adequately capture new publications with our current search tools? And at that point, the May 2020 paper manuscript was almost brand new, right? Because I knew I was, it was coming out. So I was actively looking for it in the literature. But what if you didn't know about it and you were looking and you saw this variant in your patient, would you be able to see it in August of 2021 when the paper came out in, in, in May, right? So I think we sort of know what this outcome is going to be, but it was an exercise that at that point in time to really cement my view that a live search tool for publications is really important. Um, but I'm going to go through quickly what we saw. Obviously in August, 2021, the paper was published in May 2021. Not not surprisingly, HTMD has not um, had had that that paper curated and into a into the database because it's only been three months, right? This gets updated quarterly, but it's been three months. You know, maybe in the next, you know, the next one they would they, this paper would have made it in. But at that point, you know, three months in, if you were referring to HTMD, that variant, um, that paper would not be. We didn't review, he would not pick it up. Uh, Mastermind in August um, of 2021, the paper was published in May, May, May 3rd. I was happy that, you know, I knew that it was already gonna be there, that it did pick it up adequately just by inputting the gene and the variant information. So that was to be expected because we knew that Mastermind was able to do a live search. I'm kind of going through a couple of different different search tools, right? So in the past, before being able to use Mastermind, we did a lot of Google. You know, Google was the best, you know, the best thing that right? we, we, could, we could do a gene. It did okay for genes, but variants was hard. Um, there's an NCBI um, review, search tool that is that is out right now called Litbar2. You know, I did search Litbar to see how it performs. It does nicely pick up that publication, which was which was great. Um, and then, you know, can you can you find this variant if you're looking at PubMed? The answer is no, because I think PubMed is just not equipped to do variant specific search. Same thing for if you do Google, you know, I think because variant nomenclature is just very hard for it to isolate, you know, you won't be able to pull anything. So kind of, you know, looking at what we can do, right? So if we have a brand new publication, my confidence is that if I put it in Mastermind, you know, I'm going to be able to capture publications that would mention those variants. Um, Litbar seems to perform pretty well too, um, but part of, the, part of the problem about Litbar right now is that it doesn't search CNV, which is what we do a lot of on a daily basis for both our NGS and our microarray platform. So, um, so we are still fortunate to have the use of Mastermind to be able to support our CNV and um, sequence variant interpretation. So some quickly take on, take on points to just kind of um, summarize what I've talked about. 
so really I, I hope that in um, listening today you you have an appreciation that you know the, the lit review process is a critical critical cri has a critical role for the diagnosis of rare pediatric disorders as a single publication can positively impact the diagnosis um, even though the pipeline updates are regularly performed you have to acknowledge that static lit databases would have a likelihood of missing newly newly published papers so you need to have comprehensive real-time search tools that can make sure that at the point when you do the interpretation, you have really done your best to make sure that there are no known publications that are out there, at least at the point of reporting, right? So in our experience, um, and I think with the case examples that I've shown, that really the usage of such a real-time search tool um, with, a, with, with this variant specific search capabilities was key and has definitely positively impacted our diagnosis of cases that we encounter in the clinical lab. So with that, I'm going to acknowledge our molecular diagnostics team at Louis, um, these are the people, and of course our bioinformatics team. Um, all this clinical testing work that we do is only possible because of everybody, um, the great team that's involved here in, at Louis. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Kylie. Outstanding um, information. Uh, we will now move um, to the Q&A portion of our talk today. We have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, so we'll take time to, to answer those. For those of you who submit a question that we don't get to, um, our team will work to get your questions answered after, after the event today. So let's look. Our first question, how often do you find more articles in Mastermind? How many more articles when you're searching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can speak to our experience about um, how many more articles we, we see. I would say that it is not uncommon that we find articles from Mastermind because it is just able to pull out the very specific information. Um, but I would say a lot of times it may be maybe pulling out information that was in the paper as a site mention, right? So that happens. A, a lot of times, but which is fine because we want to be able to pull that. Um, so I would say it's a pretty frequent occurrence that we actually find more papers in Mastermind. Um, but you know that's just the difference between a curated database versus, versus a real-time search is that the real-time search is supposed to give you more, whereas the curated database is not supposed to give you everything that is out there. It's only supposed to be something that you know they've deemed relevant. But the the kind of fail points we have discussed is that you know sometimes the curation just missed papers that actually should have been curated but not right. So a real time search then gives you back the power of you know the lab, the testing lab being the being the one that is able to assess that and see if that paper is relevant. Yeah, and I'm I'm just gonna jump in with one thing there, um, and that's where I kind of brought that up earlier. You know, we can talk about um, if anybody can contact us if you're interested, we can talk about helping you build a pipeline. Um, so that's where we do have that ability to annotate files, annotate variants in a real time manner, but in within part of your automated pipeline. Um, so that's where we can, you know, really build that. In that way, we could actually, you know, it can kind of take a more mastermind first approach, seeing if there are, if there are publications and, and Kylie, in your example, it's great, right? Like if you annotate then with HGMD and our, our software, you'd be able to see those numbers side by side, right? I have nothing here. I have, you know, one article about that intronic variant or that splice <laughs> uh, disruption variant in Mastermind, you know, now I can click there and see what that link is like. Um, so it definitely is with our ethos of sensitivity first, we wanna return every article potentially possible about that variant in order to make sure that we equip your team to make a, you know, the best decision to support your clinical decision and, and really support the patient. Nice, thank you both. I think we, given the time, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so uh, how do you choose your targeted CNVs for MLPA? Are those identified by NGS and then MLPA is used for confirmation? Yeah, so we, we do our MLPA as a targeted um, CNV test testing and algorithm more for like um, follow up testing, right? So if we if we have a proband that is identified to have a CNV, the parents will get MLPA. 
Um, same thing, sometimes we use MLP as a sort of a confirmation test for our NGS CND calls that are a bit less robust than in the microarrays. So we, we use it both as a follow-up for both our CND, sorry, for our microarrays and our NGS CND calls. Great, thanks. Um, you know what, let's do one more question. Um, there are phenotypes for all the cases. Do you use phenotype terms when searching or filtering, filtering variants? Do you find that they help? Yeah, so I, I think it really depends on, um, are you looking at a common phenotype condition? Um, I, I really like to do that when the condition is really rare I would, you know, I would put in, you know, if I'm really overwhelmed, right? So if, if it's, I'm looking at a disease and a gene that is, that has a lot of information already out there and I'm overwhelmed, then I like to use the phenotype term to kind of really trim it down to only show me the you know, phenotype that is immunodeficiency and not everything else that's out there. So I, I do use that sometimes, but when I'm trying to be very broad, you know, I don't do the phenotype because I want to be on encompassing, want to see everything is out there in the gene. But usually the phenotype is the is kind of the next stage to clean up what um, we were seeing as such. Yeah, I think that's the the best rec workflow and the one that we actually recommend, which is you know sensitivity first. Try your variant or C and V or whatever it is you're searching, and then from there add those phenotype terms. Um, that's part of what we talk about when we say associations. That's one of the others. Um, so you can enter those as a as a filter to specify your search more um, and really hone down on what it is you're looking for and, and be able to read all of that information then in the sentence fragments. Um, so you can really then see your phenotype term in conjunction with your gene variant or copy number variant or whatever it is you're searching. Yeah. Awesome, thank you both. Well, we're almost to time here. I wanna give you both the opportunity to, if you have any closing remarks for our, our outstanding discussion today. No. Uh, for me, I just want to thank Kylie. Thank you so much for putting these slides together for us and really going through a CNV analysis. I know that copy number variant uh, analysis is incredibly difficult, so I think this was really uh, helpful to some of our other customers. Um, and I love that you gave the example of trying to find that article within Mastermind. Um, and if anybody ever does find one that they want to submit to us, we also have that as part of our process. So um, email us at support at genomenon.com if you have any any questions. Okay, so at this point, um, we will move to our next phase here. Um, Kylie and Britt, thanks again for sharing your insights around CNV and sequence variant interpretation. Fascinating conversation we had and really important as well um, in the context of patient care. Um, and thanks to everyone watching. As a reminder, you will receive a recording of this discussion later today. Uh, also, if you don't yet have a Mastermind account, you can sign up at the link below that you see on your screen um, and start with a free trial of the professional edition. Uh, if you're currently using BASIC, you can talk to us about upgrading to get access to the features that Kylie and Brittany went through today. Um, and as always, as Britt mentioned, if you have any questions at all, do not hesitate to reach out to us at support at genomenon.com. And that concludes our presentation today. Thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now. Thank you.